Good evening and welcome to today's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know. We are online at commonwealthclub.org on Facebook, Twitter, and check out our YouTube channel. Uh, I'm Kishore Hari, director of the Bay Area Science Festival and your moderator for tonight's program. Have you ever thought about how long you'd survive if you stood on the surface of, our sun, of the sun? Or if you could die by shaking someone's hand? It is my pleasure to introduce Cody Cassidy and Paul Doherty, who think way too much about those <laughs> questions and many more, who write about sci the science behind some of the most outlandish, impossible deaths you could ever imagine. They are here today with their new book, And Then You're Dead, What Really Happens If You Get Swallowed by a Whale, or Shot from a Cannon, or Go Barreling Over Niagara just rolls off the tongue, that full title. <laughs> um, through the scenarios in this book, Paul and Cody offer insight onto different fields of science, such as anatomy, physics, and astronomy. Paul graduated with a PhD in physics from MIT, small school. Currently, Paul works as a senior scientist at the Exploratorium here in San Francisco. There can be a woo-hoo for that. <laughs> <laughs> Paul received the Faraday Science Communicator Award from the National uh, Science Teachers Association and was chosen best science demonstrator at the World Congress of Museums in Helsinki in 1996. Yeah. Cody Cassidy is a yeah. freelance <laughs> writer and editor. He previously worked as a sports editor for Zimbio.com, a reporter for Stanford Athletics, and a writer for Coach Magazine. Thank you all for coming tonight, and we hope you enjoy this evening's program. Uh, I think we have to get started with um, a really kind of basic question. How did a sports writer and a <laughs> physicist come together uh, to write a book about how people die? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think it all started a long time ago when my dad wrote a science book with the Exploratorium, and they gave him Paul. Uh, and their sort of friendship developed over a few books, and so I knew Paul from a long time ago. And, and then as I got this idea, um, which we can talk about later, as a, <laughs> I realized I needed a scientist early on to help me write it with all of these interesting ways to die, and I had the perfect person like hey, Paul. Cody, you talk about that like it's a normal thing, the fascination <laughs> with the way people die. Where did that fascination come from? Uh, it actually came from a long time ago. I read the book The Perfect Storm uh, by Sebastian Junger, and it has this really, uh, it's a small section, but I found it really interesting on exactly what would happen when these different fishermen died, because the, the book is about fishermen who are caught in a storm and then uh, sort of vanish and gone forever, and nobody really knows what happened. They, we assume they drowned. And so uh, Sebastian tries to figure out what that feeling was like. And he sort of goes into it in a level of detail that I'd never seen before, with a, a really detailed science. Um, and I sort of found that really fascinating. I hadn't, usually people just say, you stop breathing and you know, you're underwater, of course you die. But I'd never read like five pages on exactly the, what the physics and the science is. And so I realized you could sort of do a whole book on that type of thing. And, and then I sort of gradually moved away from we sort of gradually moved away from realistic scenarios because those aren't as fun to talk about car accidents or heart attacks and more like what would happen if you jumped through a hole through Earth or went into a black hole, but sort of kept that same idea. So, Paul, what was it like when uh, Cody, you know, a, a young guy shows up and he's like, let's talk about death. <laughs> <laughs> what was that, that first meeting like when he pitched the book? Well, I kept thinking, oh, that, what, a, what a great idea for a book, because I, I, I have my, my heroes like Neil deGrasse Tyson that wrote uh, Death by Black Hole, or Phil Plate that wrote Death from the Skies, and they both did the same thing that Sebastian Younger did. They give great detail and doing the science right, and I thought, you know, but they didn't cover all the scientific ways to die. So there's, there's a few more I can cherry pick out there. Uh, leaving them to the ones that they did really well, I bet we together as a team can come up with a few more and, and uh, say them in interesting ways. You're giving a really strange impression to people about astronomers and physicists, what they're into, <laughs> but let, let's, let's all indulge a little bit. So I grew up in, in Buffalo, New York, and there's one place we always went in Buffalo, and that was to Niagara Falls. Mm -hmm. And when you went to Niagara Falls, you do one thing. 
you take a, your tourist shot <laughs> next to the barrel being pushed over Niagara Falls. It is ridiculous. And you're here to tell me this is a real thing that people did and yeah. did or didn't survive. <laughs> take the Niagara Falls. Well, uh, some have survived and some haven't. Um, <laughs> yeah. Usually if you would fall from uh, that height underwater, you would hit it about 80 miles an hour and that would be most likely lethal. Uh, but fortunately, Niagara has uh, a lot of churning water underneath it, and that sort of aeration is a good thing when you're falling because it's sort of... Uh, what? Why is the aeration a good thing? I mean, I figure you're in a barrel. There's no such thing as good thing at this moment. <laughs> but as you're coming down, why is that aeration good? So the key when you're stopping after going really quickly is to stop over a, sl a longer amount of time to sort of lower the, the g-forces, the gravitational forces on your body. Mm -hmm. And when there's water is aerated, you, it takes a while to fall down. Just like if you were to jump off a, a bridge, the Golden Gate Bridge, and, and the water was churned up and aerated, you'd have a better chance of surviving than if, you just, if it was a really calm day. Does that even, does that hold if, well, let me ask this, why, why a barrel? Like, how does the barrel help? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> the barrel helps because it, because it floats, I think, primarily, <laughs> which comes up after well, we you can, survive. Well, we can float, too, so, like, you know. Well, it's a little more floating. It's a little more flotatious than, mm -hmm. than, a, than a person. And that comes up after if you survive the fall, which is there's a somewhat decent chance that you will. Uh, then the, the, the recirculating water either spits you out, in which case you can go on to the world and, and, uh, and take photos and be famous, or it, it pushes you back underneath the falls in which case you're stuck there for a long time. And in, and in one case, um, the guy survived the, the fall, but he was stuck for hours in his barrel and eventually suffocated. So it's sort of a, can go one, way, one, one of two ways there. But, but, you're saying, <laughs> yeah. but you're saying somebody looked at a barrel and was like, this is a good idea, <laughs> then got in. What's inside the barrel? What was inside the barrel? Anything? I Nothing. think she corked it and, and pressurized it with a, with a, with a bike pump. Yeah, I think she. Pre yeah. Is there a reason mm -hmm. that is it good to pressurize it? I don't, I don't think the pressure is going to help it, help at all in this case. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I she just that. had somebody standing there with a bike <laughs> right, yeah, pump, right. pumping well, up this barrel for no apparent reason. Gives you a few more breaths. That's good. Okay. <laughs> and then went over the side and survived. Yeah, like the first no, thing. not no worse for wear. I think or the, the first teacher oh. survived. I think no. I think maybe she broke. Maybe she broke a kneecap or something. She said that she would rather get shot out of a cannon, I think is her quote, than go over it again. So I don't think she enjoyed the experience, but she did survive. Okay. The, the first person to go over was a woman, and she survived, and she thought this would make her fortune. She could take her barrel and travel the world and get money for a lecture tour, and it didn't work out either way. She, she did survive, which was good. And then the second person to go over is Bobby Leach. And Bobby Leach went over and he actually traveled the world for years afterwards with his barrel. And uh, but the, while he was in New Zealand, after showing the barrel and telling his story, he slipped on a fruit peel on the street and gouged his leg and died within the week. A banana peel got him? <laughs> a peel. We, we, they didn't identify which <laughs> it was, but, uh, but a banana peel is the slipperiest, we all know, because scientists have measured the slipperiness of fruit peels. This shows up in the book. This shows the up banana in the book. peel we, shows up in the book. Oh, you bet. So tell me about the banana peel. Why it, It's actually killed people, a banana peel. Oh, yeah. So, you, you, if your head comes from six feet up above the ground and you just fall over and hit, hit your head, you can break your skull. If you are only a three-foot tall person, you have a much better chance of falling and not breaking your skull open. But a six foot tall person, if you go down and you stop the fall with your head, that's not good. Um, but one way to go down is essentially walking is a continuous series of falls. You step, you fall forward, you step. You fall forward, you step. And that stopping when you step is really important. But get this, the ja some Japanese scientists squished banana peels and they found that a gel comes out of the banana peel. And that gel has a very low friction how low friction, you ask? Well, if you've walked on wet ice, rubber shoes on wet ice have a friction coefficient of 0.15. That's scientific measure. And uh, unitless, actually. And banana peels have a friction coefficient of 0.07. It's twice as slippery as wet ice. One of the only better things is, is the juice in your knee, which is a <laughs> friction coefficient of 0.0003. That's why your knee can work for so long so smoothly until 
That Does that mean happen. the new hot fad will be banana injections into people's knees? Well, it's, it's like many times worse than what you generate normally, but uh, yeah. I'm still stuck on this, maybe because I grew up on Looney Tunes, but the idea of people actually slipping on banana yeah. peels, I, are you talking about just on any surface, like that the yeah. friction coefficient is what that, did you say, 0.07? 0.07, yeah. So it's, it, it, friction coefficients depend on the shoe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm talking about a nice rubber-soled shoe. But yeah, the banana peel isolates you from the ground below. And, and the slipperiness happens within the layers of the peel. So you know, if you're on a nice uh, sidewalk or wooden planks, uh, you're down. And this, but the cartoons predated the actual research. Oh, that, yeah, the research was recent. This is only the latest information we bring you in this book. You know, we're, we're not gonna give you old Looney Tunes information. We're giving you science. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna try something else that I always saw in cartoons since we're in this area. A lot of times we've seen uh, characters get buried alive oh, yes. and have to dig themselves out. Is that um, possible? It, like, is that possible? <laughs> like, well. I imagine that's a, that's a way somebody could die pretty easily, but could you survive being buried alive? So, well, if you're buried under, in dirt without a coffin, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's very bad. Um, <laughs> it's about 500 pounds. It's, if you're six feet under, it's about 500 pounds of weight on you. So you're not, gonna, you're not moving. You, so you it's would... not about the air, it's just the sheer weight of it. Well, so I was just for escaping purposes. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you can be sure it was an outside job, as, as we say in the book, <laughs> if, if you see an empty grave. But, um, but you could breathe with 500 pounds on your chest uh, a few times, it, it probably like, I think a day or two. They used to do this terrible, in the early uh, days of America, there was a, a pressing technique for if somebody didn't, um, didn't plead guilty or innocent in their trial, they would put stones on their chest um, and, and more and more stones until they either pled innocent or guilty. And um, so that's how we got this uh, gruesome piece of information. With 500 pounds, it turns out you can breathe for over 24 hours. Uh, the, more, the bigger issue is the, is the, uh, the, the air. Mm -hmm. And if you're in dirt, it, it'll probably fill in your lungs and you won't last too long at all. But if you're in a coffin, uh, I think it would last, did we, I think it was like six or seven hours. The oxygen, of course, there's a competing factor to kill you because you're, own, you're actually poisoning yourself with your own exhales. Um, and it turns out that CO2, your own exhales, would poison you faster than you would run out of oxygen. Um, so that would be only like. I saw a online of recently. You did you did an AMA online, and there was an interesting question posed, and it was really about the astronauts on the space station, and it was this idea, you know, building upon this us excreting gases, like this idea of whether astronauts aboard the ISS could actually propel themselves through the station using their own farts. <laughs> Paul, did, Paul actually did the math on this. <laughs> I actually did. Uh, so how do you write the book? So you go find out what is the average volume of a human fart. It turns out it's quite a, quite a wide range, actually. Um, <laughs> I think uh, everyone's pretty familiar with uh, that uh, range. <laughs> third of a liter. And uh, what's the mass? Is it really a third of a liter? Yeah, that's, that's, that's really that's big. big. Yeah, that, that's big. That's, that's, that's to the upper end. I, I took the upper end because I wanted to get the maximum speed. But it can be as much as four milli five milliliters. So it's five milliliters up to a third of a liter. And, and then I got the, the speed of ejection. And of course, with the volume and the conditions on the space station, I could calculate the mass of the fart. And uh, the velocity, you can look up the velocity. And so m times v is momentum. And I'm a physics professor, so I conserve momentum. And I know the mass of the astronaut. And mv fart, M mv astronaut, equal and opposite, conservation of momentum. The speed is somewhere around five millionths of a mile an hour. Oh, so wow. so if, if the evil villain leaves you stranded in the middle of a big room in the space station and, and you have to get to the wall, uh, farting is going to take quite a long time. <laughs> but sneezing, on the other hand, a sneeze can be a full liter and the velocity of a sneeze is a hundred times greater than the velocity of a fart. So it's far better and, and much more pleasant for your companions to, to sneeze to propel yourself to the wall than it is to fart. I like that, that idea that you think sneezing is somehow pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't smell as bad. Well, well what, if, what if we lit the fart on fire? Oh yeah, of course, of course the Reddit AMA would ask that. Yeah, so um, if, it depends. Uh, the rocket equation requires to get the best propulsion a nozzle. So you have to actually light it just as it comes out rather than after it's. 
Well, that would be an interesting trick. <laughs> you know, he, he asked. <laughs> I just love that you did the math. <laughs> on it, was, this. it wasn't in the book. But uh, because of the book inspired the people on Reddit to ask these questions, as it will inspire you to write your questions, um, we got to answer. It was fun. <laughs> and of course I did the math. <laughs> We've talked about a few so far that are real. People have actually, this has happened in real life. Let's talk about a few that, that could happen. Um, so let's start with one that uh, one of your mentors, you said, Neil deGrasse Tyson always talks about, if we fell into a black hole. What would happen to us? Yeah, so Neil, um, uh, there you are, you have this black hole. Ten, let's go 10 solar mass black hole. Ten, 10 times the mass of the sun, the size of San Francisco. So just uh, 10 kilometers in radius. And there you are falling into this blackness in space. And we'll, we'll take it at a time when it's nice and quiescent. There's no radiation coming out. Or, or, or uh, the, the, There's not much in the way of particles to get in the way as you fall in. So but the thing is, the fall usually doesn't kill you. You fall off Transamerica Tower, you know, the fall doesn't kill you, it's the stop, right? And, but in, on a black hole, it's different. The fall will actually kill you because on the black hole, as you get close, the, your feet, falling in feet first, your feet are closer to the black hole and gravity is stronger when you're closer to the mass source and so your feet are accelerating towards the black hole more rapidly than your center of mass, which is accelerating more rapidly than your head. So at first, you get this pleasant chiropractic light straightening of your spine. Ooh, that's good. And, and for those of you from certain cultures in San Francisco, the, the, the force is towards the center of the black hole. So it's like having a wonderful corset squeezing you in. But as you get closer, wonderful, wonderful <laughs> right? Yeah. As you get closer to the black hole, say at 300 kilometers from a 10 solar mass black hole, this pull, the difference in pull between your feet and your head would actually rip apart a one meter long steel rod. So it's going to actually rip you into tiny pieces and spread you out. Uh, and, and also, meanwhile, squeezing you in with similar force. So Neil deGrasse Tyson came up with the name spaghettification. Oh. which is a really nice description of how you squeeze down and feed into the black hole. Uh, okay, so don't <laughs> jump into a black hole. Don't jump into a black hole. Even, uh, yeah. What if we did something we, uh, we can't do, like we traveled through time? Could we survive that? Well, assuming you came up with a, a time sure. travel, yes. <laughs> I have an idea. <laughs> it's been submitted. Okay. No, I, I, I like this one because um, I hadn't, I hadn't, I, as a non scientists had no idea what had happened in Earth pre-dinosaurs. We all know, I guess the idea started about what would happen when you were going back and living with the dinosaurs. And we sort of figured out that the best way to coexist with dinosaurs would be to live in the trees because most of the big predators were on the ground and you could maybe steal some eggs. Uh, but then we started to go further and further back before the dinosaurs, uh, all the way back to the beginning uh, when Earth was sort of five billion years ago, it was mostly a lava ball and you would burn up and then even a billion years later, there's still no oxygen, and it was mostly just uh, unbreathable gases, and there were meteorite strikes, and so that would be a bad time to go. <laughs> it turns out you can't really survive on Earth until just about or under a billion years ago when sort of these blue-green algae invented photo photosynthesis and created all this oxygen and what Paul would describe as the first great pollution event. And everything else died on Earth, but you would, you would survive. And of course, not for very long because there weren't anything to eat so you would, or drink, really, so you would starve to death. I, this is <laughs> kind of like breaking my brain a little bit because in the four billion year, by the way, Earth four billion years old, yeah. depending on who you hear from. But in the four billion year mm -hmm. history of the Earth, we could only survive from a, a million years forward Oh, I, I, would, I would say you could survive from uh, the, the Precambrian, sort of uh, 500 million years. Uh, it's just that, um, you know, there you'd be on land and there's no land plants, there's nothing to eat. But, you know, you, you, you've brought your, your body with you, there's some air to breathe, there's water to drink. You, while you slowly die over a month of starvation, um, mm -hmm. you, you could enjoy the, the nice barrenness of the earth. <laughs> the barrenness of the earth. <laughs> After writing um, a, a story like this with like, yeah. you know, literally dozens, if not hundreds of stories that you explored, did 
did you develop personal favorites after doing all the research? Um, yeah, I think, I think my favorites were the ones that were sort of the questions that I'd had in my head for a long time but didn't really have answers to, and sort of the questions that we all talk about. I think the, uh, one of the first ones that came up is still my favorite is the hole through Earth. Sort of what would happen if you actually dug a hole to China on your sand beach. Mm -hmm. And so just a, a hole straight down, just a hole Earth. straight all the way to China. You know, if you kept going and didn't stop at three <laughs> feet, but you just kept going all the way to China. OK, we're putting aside the craziness of that motivation <laughs> for somebody to do that. But OK, yeah, so you dig a hole through the Earth, you dig a hole through the Earth. And it turns out only like one percent of the way through Earth, it gets way too hot. You would you would burn up. It's mm -hmm. it's hot. It's as hot as an oven. Um, and so we could have stopped there, but we sort of. Ignoring that issue, we decided, well, what happens if you just were able to go all the way through? And, and then it turns out, well, the air gets actually so thick that you couldn't go all the way through. Sort of like as you're going to Mount Everest and the air gets thinner, if you go down into Earth, the air gets thicker. And eventually it would get so thick as, it got thick as water and you would stop. And you, you would no longer fall, you would just be stuck in, interminably in this hole. So so this idea of us falling through the center of the earth and coming out the other side, you just couldn't do it at all. You'd hit, I mean, beyond the fact that you would, <laughs> the, you know, the heat death, all of those, you know, well, problems, you would literally <laughs> hit a wall of air and just stop. Yeah, you would, you would stop. But I sort of, I liked to keep, we kept going and we said, okay, well, what happens if you vacuum sealed your, your well, really, if, if you didn't even, even ignoring that the air was, if you just fell at terminal velocity, it would take something like 40 hours, I think, to get to the other side. So you would be faster to just to take a plane around. <laughs> it's um, really, even if you just jumped in and let yourself free fall, it would take 40 hours to go through the earth to get to the other side? All the way to the other side, yeah. Oh, if, if it was full of uh, air at, at atmospheric pressure. Because right. okay. the terminal velocity of a human body falling uh, in, in the flat out position like this is like 120 miles an hour. So you're traveling through the entire Earth at 120 miles an hour. Uh, maybe in the pike position, it's 200 miles an hour. But it's still a long way through 12,000 miles. So that, that's quite the trip. So a, a 550 mile an hour jet going around the long way still beats you by far. Well, United doesn't sound so bad then. Oh. And then <laughs> unless unless you're a bunny. Yeah, okay, so. And then we figured out if you, if you started the hole in the continental US, you would end up in the Indian Ocean. There, China is not actually the opposite side of of the earth. Well, that's another so, problem then. <laughs> it's another problem. So you'd have to start, if you started in Oahu, on, in Hawaii, you would actually end up in Botswana. So that's really the only place in the US where you can, you can dig your hole. But then, <laughs> it, the outside of earth is actually is spinning faster than the inside. So as you fell, you would grind up against the front edge of the wall. It's sort of this ultimate road rash. Yeah, the, the, ignoring the air issue. <laughs> the equator, 24,000 miles around the equator, 24 hours in a day. The equator's traveling 1,000 miles an hour. You're traveling 1,000 miles an hour. The center of the Earth isn't. So as you fall, you have to slow down from 1,000 miles an hour to zero as you pass through the center, it's sideways velocity. And uh, the, you, how do you slow down? Road rash. The, it's the, you, know, this, you just ground away, so not, not a good thing. This is the weirdest conversation to be in, but I'm going to ask this. Um, is there a way that I could dig a shape that could account for that? Like, could I make a curve shape that might make it so I fall without hitting the sides? Well, our, our solution was to just go to the North Pole. And so then you would have a, and then you, there would be no grinding. Because um, it's doing this. Oh, oh got, it. got and, it. But if you did go to the North Pole and you took out all the air, you would actually make it to the other side. You'd hit the middle of the Earth at something like 18,000 miles per hour. And then just like on a swing, your momentum would carry you to the other side and you'd just have to grab on when you got to the other side. 38 minutes. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, that is a fast trip. How about you, Paul? Did you have a favorite in, so, the, in all of the research and, um, and writing of this book? My favorite, most surprising one was Death by Magnetism. Because I had always thought, you know, I played with magnets my whole life, and, and except for I, I was working with uh, Cody's dad, and we thought we maybe we'd do a book where we had little tiny neodymium magnets for children. And just before we went ahead with the book idea, we discovered that, uh, alas, you can eat a neodymium magnet, passes right through, no problem. But if you eat two of them, 
they're so strong, um, as one goes through your intestines and the next goes through your intestines, they get on two twisty, windy turns of the intestines oh. and pull themselves together, puncturing your intestines, and you die. So we never brought out the book with tiny, and that's why you never see these tiny magnets around anymore, because two of them and a child can be lethal. And that's the kind of thing, when you're writing books for children, you have to be really careful. You really don't want to hurt somebody with your book. But still, uh, that's physical. It's the physical magnetism. But that's not what you mean by death by magnetism. No, but you I mean, mean the actual magnetic field. I mean field. the actual magnetic field killing you. And you, uh, many of you here may have gone through an MRI where you'll have like two Tesla. We measure magnetic fields in Tesla. And two Tesla, you've been in that magnetic field, didn't do anything. You know, you're just fine. You went in, you came out the same person pretty much. Um, that, and that's a lot of magnetism. The Earth is 50 micro Teslas. So you, you're, you evolved in this 50 micro Tesla field. Two Teslas doesn't bother you at all. But recently, they discovered a neutron star that had a very strong magnetic field. How strong a magnetic field? 100 billion times, billion with a B, times stronger than the MRI machine. Now that magnetism is so strong what magnetism does, every electron in your body is a magnet. And that strength of magnet will actually take the atoms in your body, which are nice spherical things, and the electrons going around in their orbits will stretch out first into cigars and then into lines that are 200 times longer than they are thick. It'll, begin, it'll break all the bonds between all the atoms in your body. So as you, as you fall into this magnetic star, you become a, a human-shaped gas at first, and as you keep falling, the atoms themselves are ripped apart by magnetism, and you become a hot ionized plasma in the shape of a person, a smoky remain falling rapidly into the black hole, or even, it's actually a neutron star, and when you hit the neutron star, the remaining protons are, and, and electrons get turned into neutrons and you're squeezed down to smaller than the size of a red blood cell, and, except for the bits of you that go rocketing off as gamma rays. So, my favorite. I, my, if, I, if I'm going, I'm going out as a human-shaped plasma. I guess, I mean, <laughs> it is a phase change. Yeah, right. <laughs> the, uh, it's, and that's not anything to do with, uh, with like iron in our blood. That's just purely on the atomic level. That's right, on the atomic level. Every atom at that level. It turns out that every atom is either attracted or repelled by a mag in a magnetic field. Everyone. And it's just it's so weak that you've never seen it happen. But one thing I do at the Exploratorium is I take two grapes and put them on the end of a soda straw and hang the soda straw from a string. And then I bring a neodymium magnet about the size of my thumb and the, both the north and the south pole of that neodymium magnet will repel the grape. And because grapes are magnetic. Their first grade teacher didn't teach you that, did, did they? <laughs> and, but, and in fact, you are magnetic and so are frogs. And scientists have managed to fly a frog with magnetic fields. Wait, wait. Yeah. Hey, what do you mean a frog is magnetic? Go, go online, type in magnet frog fly, and you will see <laughs> it's, it's called diamagnetism. It's, it's not the magnetism you know with iron that's attracted to magnets. This is frogs are uniformly repelled by the north and the south pole of a magnet. And they made this bore of a magnet coils of wire going around, and the frog is in there. It looks like it's having the time of its life, just flying. And it was not hurt at all by the 16 Tesla magnetic field. And that, it, like, to put everyone's sort of m a mental frame around this, yeah. that's about as strong as a magnetic field as we can create, as humans that, have created, or pretty close to? Yeah, they, they go up maybe factor of four more, 40, 40 Tesla. But they, they do the 40 Tesla mm -hmm. by setting off an explosion and compressing the magnet down uh, ballistically. So uh, it's not so good for the frog if that happens. <laughs> Could you fly? The, can a human fly? With I a volunteer. Magnet? I volunteer to be the first one. I'm so sure that magnetism at that level won't hurt me. I volunteer to go first when they build the human size 16 Tesla magnet, because that's all it takes to fly me, too. But it has to be big. Mm. So I, I want it. Okay. <laughs> I want it bad. <laughs> 
Uh, with all of these these little stories that you came up with the book, how did you do like the process of researching this? Like talking about frogs flying with magnetic fields and everything else. Like how did this process begin? Did you just naturally have this question? I'm like, I wonder if I could kill myself with this magnet. <laughs> One Pretty of my much. students invented neodymium magnets, Chris Thrush at General Motors Research Lab. So I've known neodymium magnets forever. Mm -hmm. so, so I sort of knew about the frogs. But for most of the things, yeah, Cody I think, would start. <laughs> I think to get the ideas, we, we sort of, well, first when you started this project, I sort of looked at everything and wondered <laughs> if it could kill me or not. And, <laughs> and then a lot of times you can sort of make it kill you if you <laughs> just turn it up enough, just like magnetism or <laughs> food or anything like mm -hmm. that. Um, but other ones we sort of mind, childhood, fears, like I was saying, or common questions, sort of the penny dropped from the Empire State Building or the... Um, the does that kill you? The penny does not. The penny only is so light and has such a large surface area in comparison to its weight that it falls at only like 25 miles an hour is its sort of max terminal velocity. So it's really the same as somebody just kind of throwing one at you. Um, there are other things, though, that, that can kill you at... We figured out that uh, is something as simple as a pen. Does Paul have one? Yeah, the pen, particularly the one with the, uh, the fletching there, or the, uh, the, the, uh, the shirt clip mm -hmm. acts as like a fletching on an arrow to sort of keep it pointed straight down. And rods are particularly good at penetrating. So 190, 190 miles an hour, that, that steel pen would probably, would probably pierce your skull. Uh I, again, that's going to be weird, but let's talk about other stuff we can throw off the Empire State <laughs> Building and, yeah. and see how it would do. Like if we threw a book, very high surface area. Book would be okay. Your book is only, uh, again, like 20 miles an hour. But mm -hmm. a, ba a baseball we did is, would hit about 100 miles an hour. Okay. So it's like a, the, the speed of a major league pitch. But we know people survive that all the time. We right. see people get hit with 100 You could mile be killed by a 100 mile an hour pitch, but it would probably be, it's unlikely. It, mm -hmm. There was a, a catcher here in the 1930s. Joe Sprins. Joe Sprins set the record for the long, the, they had a blimp fly above him and drop a baseball, and he caught it. Um, but it sort of carried its momentum and broke his, broke his jaw. But he, he, was, he survived. So wow. you could catch it, and you would probably be okay, but you should probably wear a, a face mask. 1930s were an amazing time. People flying blimps around, dropping baseballs out of it. Uh, and, but, like, you know, we can go to extremes, too. If we threw, like, I don't know, like a, a whale off the <laughs> Empire State Building, that would get you, right? Yeah, we did do the blue whale. The blue whale would get you. It would still only accelerate to 190 miles an hour because that's sort of the terminal velocity. But it would, um, somebody has a great term for this. It's called splashing. It's when the guts, the outward expansion of guts can, are not contained by uh, the animal's skin. It has so much momentum that the guts would hit and, and splash. It would be very messy. Um, but that would, that would also be, be fatal. Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Douglas Adams did the falling blue whale before us. So you, you, <laughs> he got, you got to respect. Huh? He did the math on it too? I, I suspect he did. He knew oh, his stuff. Okay. Oh, were there stories that you, um, that you did that got left on the cutting room floor? Yeah, so Cody came up with one, the Devil's Super Soaker. Yeah, we did one. Well, yeah, some, the Devil's Super Soaker, which was a lot of awful chemicals that would either kill you. There was one chemical. What was the chemical that would just smell so bad? Uh, oh, yeah, there's one. I don't remember the name of the smelly one, but there's uh, <laughs> chlorine trifluoride. Does not sound like a friendly chemical. This, this is a chemical that when spilled on sand, sets it on fire, okay? <laughs> and, and the fumes are poisonous. There's a rule of thumb about what happens in a chlorine trifluoride spill. And the rule of thumb is this, run. <laughs> run until when you stretch your thumb out at arm's length, it covers the building where the spill happened. <laughs> it's, it's dangerous stuff. So if somebody has a, the problem was we couldn't put it in the book because the super soaker, what do you make the super soaker out of that you put the chemical in that sets sand on fire. I mean, this is, this is, you, it's really hard to hold this stuff. The other one that we had, there is, um, we tried to do, right now the oxygen is sort of bouncing around this room like, a, oh, yeah. like an old Microsoft screensaver, really. Um, but there's a lot of oxygen molecules. However, there's a, there's a chance that they would all end up on the other side of the room and, and we would suffocate up here. And it's, it's not a very big chance, but there is a, there is a chance. And I just tried to get, but Paul couldn't, I couldn't understand how small that chance was, <laughs> and so we didn't put it in the book. Like, what, what is the chance of that? I, I don't know the numbers now, but the, yes. the, the number is so, it's it, it beyond astronomically Im impossible. Mm -hmm. 
to have the number, the, the, the chances that uh, all of the oxygen atoms in this room would end up in the corner would all suffocate without oxygen. It's just, there's so many oxygen molecules all independently moving around that uh, I, I came up with this humongous number and there's just no sense of how tiny this chance is. It's, I think, it's just, yeah, because we but were But you're say, saying there's a chance. <laughs> there's a chance. There is a chance that we can actually was calculate a, the number. A fraction and it was one and then just zeros for the rest of the book. That number wouldn't, right, wouldn't, yeah. come, quite, wouldn't come close to yeah. approximating how small it is. So we have a, a few audience suggestions. Okay. <laughs> how much ice cream would it take for you to eat before you would die? I like how you like your like, yes, we've thought about this one. <laughs> it's in the book. <laughs> it's in the book. We did we did a cookies. We did a cookies, but I think this, yeah, this the same principle would hold for ice cream. So it's about four four liters is what we figured out. There was an experiment um, uh, a long time ago where they pumped a stomach full of water in a cadaver to see exactly how much liquid it would hold. And right around four liters, the stomach burst around the lesser curvature. If you think of the stomach as a looking like a kidney bean, it's sort of that part that bends inwards. Yeah. It turns out it's the sort of weak point in our stomach. Mm -hmm. and, it, and at about four liters, that would break, and, and in Unbroke, it's cookies, but it, ice cream would also kill you as well because it has, it, you're not really used to mixing these outside. So this would be just pure, purely from the volume of food, and it would just rupture your stomach? Right, yeah, mm -hmm. purely from the volume, your stomach cannot, usually a stomach will, cause you to throw up when, before you, long before you get there. So there's no, right. there's no risk. With, stick with me on this idea. Could I eat enough ice cream to lower my body temperature to kill me? <laughs> More than four liters? If, ignoring the, ignoring <laughs> the stomach? <laughs> Could I generate an ice cream headache really big enough <laughs> to get me? You're going to ponder that for a second. I like how yeah. Paul's trying uh, to do the math Paul's Of course here. I am. <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. I think, uh, I th I think it's going to be hard to... Uh, lower your body temperatures uh, enough with, because uh, there's this limit. I mean, you have this limit of four liters of ice cream. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, eight pounds of ice cream, um, one twentieth of a human um, at zero degrees Celsius, <laughs> and uh, so one twentieth, and then the rest of the human at 37 Celsius. So th this, this, uh, just just doing the thermodynamics it could lower your temperature to a point where you, you're borderline passing out, mm -hmm. you know, um, but at least you're gonna pass out happy. <laughs> <laughs> I love how you did that math. Like, this seems like an insurmountable problem, but the yeah. math that you are just doing right now is really accessible. How did you, like, I'm curious if you can break down how you thought about it. Yeah, so the, when I went to MIT, and the very first physics class at MIT, uh, Professor Tony French told us, Whenever you go to solve a physics problem, before you sit down and do the math, you should know the answer. And you should do the, know the answer just by doing something called solve the Fermi problem. Enrico Fermi was noted for knowing enough shit about the world that when somebody asked him a question, he could just draw these numbers out and do a rapid calculation to know roughly what the answer was gonna be. Then you sit down and you do the real physics. Physics that can stand up to people arguing with you. But, but before you publish your answer, you check it against the thing you did at first and see how close you came and, mm -hmm. and is this un, unreasonable. So th this whole skill was just sort of beaten into me through all of college, which was figure out the answer quickly. And, and it's really fun to do that. All right, our next one comes from a Simpsons episode. Oh yeah. So I, there, I actually thought of another one uh, from Simpsons. <laughs> Um, there's a famous Simpsons episode where Sideshow Bob uh, starts stepping on rakes and they <laughs> whack him in the head. One. Could that get you? A rake to the head. One rake to the head? Probably. Well, he does repeatedly do <laughs> it's, it's it multiple repeated, times. Isn't it? hmm. um, these are ones that when I just asked Paul, this is, sort of our, <laughs> this is exactly how we sort of wrote the book. Yeah. I would just fire questions like this at Paul. <laughs> so is this what the process of the book like, was yeah. like? The two of you just locked in a room and you... Come up with a lot of weird questions like how many rakes could you smash over your head? And then, <laughs> and then it that. turns out if the science is... And then you, you usually, a lot of times it doesn't lead anywhere or something. But if, mm -hmm. And then sometimes the science gets so interesting that, that you, it, can, it merits being included. But like Cody solved some of them by doing research. I mean, we, we can talk about sharks later, and Cody goes one to solve the shark problem. But okay, but here it is. So I got this rake on the ground, and I know if I fall on the ground, my head hits, 
and it will crack my skull. Now I step on this rake, and I have my body weight, and here's a lever. I have a little short lever here, and that's the tip of the rake, and it's going off like this, and I step, and the raker com comes up, and it's coming up pretty fast, probably made of wood. It's going to come in. I hope it hits my nose, because my nose is going to slow it down before it whacks the, the solid part of my skull, okay? It's going to hurt like hell, but at least I'll live. But I think that even at a, a high-speed rake uh, will hit with a... Uh, enough spread in the impact mm -hmm. that it might be hard to actually crack a skull. Skulls are pretty hard right in the front. Now, that, that, if you're going to get hit, you might as well be hit in the front. Uh, just so, Some real Joe practical Bob, advice coming out yeah, of this don't, panel. Don't run backwards in a field of rakes, <laughs> I think, because that's <laughs> weak, skulls weaker back there. Yeah. I, I, have another weird, <laughs> I have another weird one from The Simpsons. There is a scene where Bart Simpson takes a bunch of bullhorns and lines them up in unison, uh -huh. and then set, like whispers in the end, but it like constantly amplifies and has this shock wave that ripples <laughs> out through town. And it, it has me wonder, can you actually be killed by sound? You found yeah. out. We think so. <laughs> <laughs> so sound at below, um, they've never, it's never happened before. Mm -hmm. If you count blast waves, like shock waves, we, we weren't counting those in, in, as sound because it's really the same thing, it's pushing air, but it, it, those are comes from bombs and stuff mm -hmm. like that, and those, have, of course, are very dangerous. But sound, I think the loudest sound that we could find was a pure sound, was a horn in the Netherlands that they fire at, um, they fire it at these at NASA spaceships to, to test their ability to withstand the sound of the rocket launch. And that was like at 150 decibels, mm -hmm. which, which wouldn't kill you, it would blow out your eardrums, but it wouldn't kill you. But around 190 decibels, we think is, which is right about the limit where sound starts becoming a shock wave. Mm -hmm. We think it would, it would probably burst the uh, alveoli in your lungs, which are probably the weakest points to pressure differences. Okay, follow but, me with this. Okay. I have an add-on. So sound is, is propagated in a medium. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the limits of sound in air, mm -hmm. in our atmosphere. Would that hold if we were underwater? So no, in fact, so um, what I was doing, I was saying, let's, let's kill with musical sound. I mean, let's turn it up to 11, right? <laughs> and and, and, and uh, musical sound is a sinusoidal oscillation. So there's a limit to how low you can go on a pressure. It's zero. You can't have a pressure below zero. So that means a musical sound goes down to a pressure of zero and goes up to a pressure of two. Zero to two, zero to two in air. And that gives you 194 decibels or so. And uh, that... It blows your eardrums out, but may or may does, doesn't liquefy your body or anything. So I think we think you're okay with, with the loudest music. But in the water, you have a much denser medium. And in the, in the water, you can have uh, more than 10,000 times more energy density. And so um, you can really be injured with a sinusoidal sound wave. And in fact, I was giving a lecture once. I play the plastic corrugated tube as my musical instrument. I, I whirl the tube over my head and it sings. And, after, and I solved the physics problem of how does this sing? And I presented a lecture. And afterwards, the sound engineer came up to me and he said, okay, I gotta tell you this, he said, I'm an engineer on a drilling rig in, in the Norwegian sea. And we had this one drill rig that was vibrating itself to shreds because they were pumping gas through this tube, but the gas was under tremendous pressure. It was deep down under the ocean water. So the gas was under tremendous pressure going through this corrugated metal tube, making a sound that was destroying the drill rig. Wow. So uh, high pressure gas sounds, for example, if you go to hear the, the, the metal musicians on the surface of Venus where the atmospheric pressure is 100 times the pressure on the Earth, you can have 10,000 times the energy level as you can on Earth. So don't go and listen to headbanger music on Venus. It's, good, it's a good, good advice. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's been some hints that sounds under the ocean might be why like whales and other uh, marine mammals beach themselves because they're trying yeah. to get away from that, that huge uh, pressure wave that's coming. Um, speaking of, you mentioned sharks. How did sharks show up in the, in the book? <laughs> Well, that's just another one of those classic fears that we sort of yeah. had to investigate. Um, and, and it turns out sharks probably, well, first, they don't bite very often. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's not a very realistic concern. <laughs> we found out that 
you're actually more likely to fall into a sand pit and die on your way to the ocean than you are actually to be bit by a shark. It's more, that's more common. But if they do take an interest in you, um, they usually come up from behind is sort of the other attack mode. And we don't think they're doing it out of hunger. It's, they've actually reconstructed shark bite victims before and it turns out that you, there's nothing missing. It's really just a bite. It's a, it's a bite and run. Oh, it's a love tap. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a love tap, but they're, they're 20 feet long and mm -hmm. they have big mouths. So, but if they, so that we're sort of like the, uh, I, I call it like the squirrels of the ocean because I think they like animals that have more fat on them, like seals, than, uh, than we do. But if you're really unlucky and they do get you uh, and they get your leg because they like to come up from below and behind, it really depends on how, on how they bite your, the, the big problem with getting your leg bit is this uh, femoral artery that runs through your leg and if it's, if it's severed, it's, it's, you bleed out in a matter of minutes. Um, but, but really, we found out this interesting fact about the, the femoral artery is if, you, if it's a clean bite, we think if your leg were taken clean off, the femoral artery would snap back. It's under a bit of tension, sort of like mm -hmm. a strep, stretch rubber band. And it would snap back into your, the leg muscles and they would sort of pinch it shut. And that might give you time to put on a tourniquet or something. But if it were sort of a jagged cut and they just sort of didn't take the whole leg, it would be much worse. So building upon this idea, <laughs> this is such a weird job tonight. Yeah. Um, yeah, good. Is the Sharknado possible then? <laughs> I, uh, you know, I'm going to have to see. You're going to have to show me a Sharknado before I believe it. Uh, but however, I d as, as the senior scientist at the Exploratorium, I did get a phone call one day from the Chronicle. And they said, these people just returned to their house on the coast in Marin and found it covered with fish. What happened? And I said, okay, I've got two possibilities. I like how the Chronicle's first call is to the Exploratorium <laughs> when that happens. Who are you going to call? <laughs> the Exploratorium. Two possibilities, I said. One, do you have a frat boy in your house? <laughs> did, did the competing fraternity come out with, with uh, fish and uh, slingshots? Mm. Or perhaps there was a water spout off the coast which then uh, actually siphoned up water from the surface of the ocean containing fish, came over land, lost its energy source, died out, and dropped fish over your house. And it turned out that that very day after I said that, they found out there were water spouts off the coast of California. And this, is, this happens around the world. Uh, people come home and their houses are buried in frogs and and things. <laughs> and so uh, water spouts can actually pick up the surface waters of the ocean along with things swimming in them. No, this did <laughs> not happen. This did happen. Yeah. You, can, you can look in the San Francisco uh, Chronicle records, look under fish falling from the sky, and you will find this reported, and uh, it actually happens. Wow. Yeah. Uh, this is the Commonwealth Club of California program, and we are talking to Cody Cassidy and Paul Doherty with their new book, And Then You're Dead, What Really Happens If You Get Swallowed by a Whale, Are Shot by a Cannon, or Go Barreling Over the Niagara. Uh, I'm Kishore Hari, your moderator. You can listen to Commonwealth programs on the radio or podcast, watch our YouTube channel, check our website, or follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Um, I have to talk about the scariest chapter in the book for me. And that's, I am allergic to the deadliest animal uh, here on Earth. I am allergic to the mosquito. The mosquito, it, like, I hate the mosquito. Like, I am one of those that's like, let's eradicate this whole species off the planet. I'm usually a conservation person, not with the mosquito. Um, and you posit an interesting question. Like, not can mosquitoes kill you with the diseases they carry, but it, could a mosquito just simply suck you dry with enough mosquitoes. So we found some researchers in the North Slope who were... <laughs> you gotta just pause there. Right, yeah. You found some researchers that actually studied this question. Yes. Well, they were studying something else, I think. And, but uh, just some one vodka soaked night in the <laughs> sort of Alaska North Slope where there's a mosquito infestation. They went out and with bare chests and for one minute, just to see how many mosquito bites they would get. And they came back and they had, I think it was 9,000 mosquito bites in a single minute. Which, 9,000 mosquito bites, mosquitoes don't take very many blood, that, that's not lethal, but it's, 
they take about five microliters, micro, microliters of blood each bite. And if you, at 9,000, you actually, it can become lethal. No, no, not there. So, so at a million, it's a liter. Right. It's five liters. I'm sorry, a million mosquito bites is five liters because it's five microliters per bite. So um, at, at 200,000, you lose a liter. It's like blood donation, you know? So, <laughs> and and uh, 400,000, two liters. Now you're beginning to get a little bit uh, lightheaded. Is this possible? Like, uh, has this actually happened to a human? They've died from just being sucked dry from a mosquito? We weren't able to find I don't think human. it's happened. There's some, some yeah. urban legends, yeah. but I don't think that it's, that it's, there's nothing confirmable that anybody's yeah. actually been sucked. Of course, there's other ways to die from mosquitoes, but no, nobody's actually been sucked dry from mosquitoes. We don't think. Has this happened to other animals then? Yeah, I think yeah. A young elk sometimes, if, if they're, you know, they come out and they're, they, they can get sucked really down. So, and, they, and they're hairy too. I mean, <laughs> wow. You think the mosquito have to work to get into the skin there. I hope that paper got published for going out and getting bit 9,000 <laughs> times. Wow. And I, I wonder if they had that much vodka, what the mosquitoes thought of the, you know, Maybe. The, <laughs> drunken mosquito. Yeah. Um, <laughs> another question that I don't know how you'd answer this, but let's try. What would happen if you step outside of a spaceship traveling at light speed? Um, tricky because no material object can travel at light speed, but well, let's, let's um, say approaching light speed. <laughs> let's say approaching light speed. Well, we'll do, um, like the, uh, L large hadron collider light speed minus seven miles an hour. Okay, that's, that, that's how fast the protons go in the large hadron collider. So, um, there you are and you step outside of that spaceship as long as you're out there in intergalactic space where there is one atom per cubic meter. You're, you're just fine. You know, again, here's a case where speed doesn't kill. But collisions with things at speed kill. So now you plunge into a galaxy. And now there's one atom per centimeter cubed. And those atoms are beginning to hit you at the speed of the Large Hadron Collider. Okay? And, and that mean, mo the good news here is mostly they're going to miss. Protons are really tiny. And they don't even notice the electrons. They're, they're going to blast through. They're gonna, and mostly we're mostly empty space. We're mostly empty space, right? And like on that level yeah. we are. But, you know, you, you go for a while in inter, inter, uh, galactic space or, or in interstellar space, and you get enough of these. That when they do collide, they send out a spray of radioactive particles that rip you to shreds internally. They, they, they can destroy your DNA. They, they, they just, um, it's, it's deadly. So if you're going to do this... Hop in and out real quick. Yeah, that's right. Get, get back in, something protecting you. Or and, falling, and do, into, yeah. falling into a black hole, right? A, a giant one. The giant one, yeah, right. well, we can, we can do that later. <laughs> you can fall into a giant black hole? Yeah, so a, a small black hole, it, it's, it's mm -hmm. 10 solar masses, and it's uh, 30 kilometers in radius. And, uh, and it's, um, the gravity gets weaker and weaker and weaker with distance. But we now know that there's a four million solar mass black hole at the center of our galaxy. In fact, they just operated the telescope a couple weeks ago called the Event Horizon Telescope to give us our first picture ever of the surface of the black hole at the center of our galaxy. But it's four million solar masses and 12 million kilometers in radius. It, it's so big that the gravity falls off more gently. So you can actually fall into the four million black hole, supermassive black hole, without being ripped apart by gravity on your way in. And I volunteer to do this too, because <laughs> um, light cannot escape from the black hole. We can't know what's inside the black hole. The only way to know is to go there. And with a supermassive black hole, I can go there. I can fall through the event horizon. And now I'm inside and I can see. Who knows? It's un and, and then I'm a scientist. I love to share what I find with other people. Well, that would be a problem in this scenario. <laughs> it's a problem. Light well, can't get out. Yeah, light can't get out. <laughs> so. I brought my semaphore with me and I can't flash the signal. <laughs> no, so. oh, well. we, we ignored one that's crucial that's in the title of the book, The Human Cannonball. <laughs> what happens with the human cannonball? I think this was the, the very first one, yeah. We uh, sent this to Paul. It's, the, it's really the accelerator. Uh, normal human in a circus cannonballs are actually... They're dangerous, but they're survivable. You only accelerate to 30 or 40 miles an hour, and you land in a net, which isn't particularly safe, but 
uh, survivable. But a real cannon, I think you would, you would accelerate with so much g-forces that you would be condensed into a, a, thin, a thin disc. Everything would be sort of crushed down except for your water. And then you would, you would hit the atmosphere so fast it would actually turn to steam. With all the friction with the atmosphere, you'd turn to steam. So it would be sort of this super hot, bloody mist that would be sort of ejected into the, into the air there. It would be quick, though. Yeah. So it's the acceleration <laughs> is the problem. It's the acceleration. Yeah. And in fact, there's this great guy you should thank. It is, his name is Colonel John Stapp. And he actually set the world land speed record in a rocket sled on his way to have the rocket sled stop very quickly. It had a big scoop on the bottom and they had a big water tank. And so he, was, he volunteered to test the survivability of straps holding pilots into jet aircraft. And until then, the straps would only, were only built to like 15 Gs because they didn't think people could take 15 Gs. And Stapp, going point n Mach 0.9, almost Mach 1, speed of sound, stopped with 46 Gs. He bloodied the retinas of his eyes, he broke both wrists, he cracked some ribs, but he walked out of it alive. And so they upped the strength of shoulder harnesses constraining people, because now they knew people could survive 46 Gs for short periods of time. And it took one person volunteering to do that for us to find out. Mm -hmm. Wow. The cannon is a few thousand, though, so it would be the, beyond. They'll be right, yeah, so. <laughs> Yeah. If you could choose one way to go that's in the book, how would you go? Well, I do love the black hole one, but I'll, I'll leave Paul with that just because of the beautiful, <laughs> <laughs> the beautiful view. Um, we did one that was, uh, what would happen if you were stuck in a, in a gas station? Sort of uh, <laughs> takes, <laughs> what ha what? basically what would I happen? I think we've all been there. <laughs> yeah. We've been stuck in a gas station. But if you were just kept getting stuck in there and nobody ever let you out, what would happen? And it was basically how long could you eat sort of junk food and, and survive it? What would happen? Mm -hmm. um, and it turns out that food that has vitamin C in it doesn't last very well. So after a few days, even if this was a good gas station and it had oranges and bananas, they would be long gone and rotten by the time after a week or two. So if you were still stuck in there, you wouldn't have any vitamin C. And after a month with no vitamin C, you start developing these developing scurvy, which is uh, yeah. actually used to kill sailors all the time, sort of in this lag period where they had better maps and better boats, but they didn't have um, food preservation. Scurvy was killing him. I think Magellan lost 80% of his sailors on one, long, on one long trip from scurvy until they realized you should start bringing limes on your, on your long voyages. Mm -hmm. But anyways, after a month, you start developing these symptoms of scurvy. Your, month, your gums would start to bleed and you'd start to not be able to repair your capillaries. And after around two months of being stuck in a gas station, eating only gas station food and hot dogs, we think scurvy would, you would, you would die from scurvy. <laughs> there is no way anyone's lasting a month in a gas station by <laughs> yeah, themselves. Yeah, surviving one gas station hot dog is a, is a feat in and of itself. <laughs> you'd, you'd be amazed, actually, mutiny on the bounty. When Captain Bly was put in the boat, he, they went out across, he, he navigated them across the ocean with just essentially no food and just rainwater, and they mostly survived for a month without food, just, just in, on rainwater. And so that, that's kind of the, the study about how long people can go with no food at all. And they weren't well-nourished sailors to start with. You know. But I, I, I have to rewind. You chose the gas station <laughs> the way you wanted to go? Well, of I all like the junk things? food. <laughs> you like They're candy. all because of the junk food. <laughs> Um, Paul, which way would you well, go? Actually, of course, I told you earlier, I, w I would go to the Magnetar just mm. because it's such a great way to go. Mm. However, uh, if, if I'm actually going to have to die, uh, I'll, I'll choose one that I've actually been trained to, to do. Um, I got drafted for the Vietnam War, and the Air Force decided to train me in escape and evasion. And one of the things they train you in is, you know, that you're taking that airplane flight, and the stewardess comes up and says, in case of a loss of cabin pressure incident, Ma oxygen mask will drop from above, put them over your nose and mouth, and breathe normally. Right. So here's what really happens. There's a foomp. All the gas in your body comes out. And it's rich in moisture, and, it, and expanding it cools, and it makes a cloud, and everybody thinks, 
oh my God, the airplane's on fire. Mm -hmm. But it's but not. It's, it's just, just Carl the Fog coming out. It's just the fog coming out of you. It's just, yeah, Carl the, oh, Carl mm -hmm. the Fog, of course, that's it. <laughs> and then it clears and you're breathing normally. And then sometimes later, hopefully you wake up and you haven't noticed anything going wrong at all because your body n does not have a way to detect that it's not getting oxygen. The only thing your body detects to tell you to breathe is the buildup of CO2. And you're breathing normally. There's this air up there at 35,000 feet. It doesn't have enough oxygen to keep you alive. You're breathing out the CO2. Your body totally happily just fades out and you don't notice at all. And this is what they're teaching you in the Air Force uh, survival thing. Get that mask on within 15 seconds because that pure oxygen at that altitude will keep you alive. And uh, so it, I, when that mask comes down, it's on my face, let me tell you. <laughs> so I've always wondered this. Um, the, the cabin in, in an airplane, yeah. it, it's pressurized. What's right. it pressurized to? So I have an altimeter watch, and I always ask this question when I'm flying. I look down, and very often around 7,000 feet. So you, know, you go to Tuolumne Meadows at 9,000 feet, you're at a higher altitude than a lot of those aircraft cabins. So, oh, yeah. so, I mean, they always say when you go to higher altitudes, drink yeah. more water. Yeah. Um, because you, you get dehydrated faster. Is that why I feel so bad coming off of airplanes? Like, yeah. I just have to drink some water? Drink and... water to keep hydrated. Alcohol does the opposite. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, if, you're, if you want to feel your best coming off the airplane, drink water. So if you're at 7,000 and there's an expl you know, a decompression of sorts, yeah. like, is there a height that it's okay to be at that you can survive you know, yeah. you know, you can make it through? Yeah, so under 20,000 feet or so, you, you'll, you can survive quite a while, mm -hmm. but up around 35,000 and above, you, you don't have very long to survive. But the key thing we discovered, mm -hmm. say you've got the window seat and the window blows out. It's 7,000 feet altitude inside, it's 35,000 feet outside. You can actually, I can actually do the calculation for the speed of the air going through the hole. 300 miles an hour. That wind is strong enough going through the hole next to you. It can rip you out of your seatbelt and stuff you into the hole. The good news is the normal human shoulder width is too big to fit through the hole. The bad news is your head will fit through the hole. But, you have a um, weird definition of good news. That, no, it's good news. No, you, you do not want to leave the airplane. No, no, <laughs> Fair that, 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 that pilot and that co-pilot, they're bringing it down to low altitude to get it so everybody survives, whether they have the oxygen mask on or not. Okay, yeah. so that's what happens at the window. Right. What happens if I'm on the aisle? Yeah, no problem at all. It, it turns out, <laughs> it's like, the, the, as, as Cody wrote beautifully, it's like you pull the plug in a bathtub. You're sitting in the bathtub. Man, that, you get that plug near, the, the, near where it's going out the hole, wham, it goes right back in. You hold it just a few inches away, it's nothing. And so the air, all the air in the cabin's rushing towards that little hole. Close to the hole, it's bad news. But the further away you get, the slower the air. You want to try one more before we, we close up? One more. <laughs> all right. How fast would a fan have to go to kill you just from the air blowing at you? <sighs> Colonel John yeah. Stapp, <laughs> who we met a little while ago, tested the answer to this. And he w went in his rocket sled with no, no windshield in front of him. And he went 575 miles an hour into the, into the wind. And you can actually see pictures of that online. John Stapp, and you can see his mouth opening and his face being peeled back, didn't no problem at all, actually. He had some goggles on. So uh, we know it's faster than 575 miles an hour. And um, that, Somebody that's, has to write a biography about this guy. He <laughs> seems to be doing you, some interesting stuff. Read this guy, man. This, this, is, this is, yeah, he, he's masculine now. But anyway, so, uh, <laughs> or masculine in the sense of, here, hold my beer, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So we've reached that time for, for one last question. And, and really, it's, it's, the, it's the reflective question. Like, after writing all of these stories, and we've had a lot of fun you know, talking about all these ways that you, you, can, you can die, but what, what do you take away from this? Like, what do you take away about ourselves? Like, I'm terrified now <laughs> to walk outside. Let, you know, I might be safe if a penny drops from the sky, but... I'm a little scared. How do you feel about things after writing all of these different little stories? Yeah, I think, I don't know, I didn't really have that reaction. I sort of, it was fun for me to face 
maybe because we got to make the decisions and not write the ones that, that scared us. There were some <laughs> ones that were gross, that were too gross that, that we thought to put in. There's one on fire that just ended, we tried a long time to make it entertaining and it ended up being just really gross and terrible. So we didn't put that in. So maybe, we, and everybody has a sort of different line. Mm -hmm. Some people are really grossed out by the buried alive ones. Mm -hmm. So that one didn't get me, so we included it. Um, so for me, I, and, and we sort of spend a lot of time talking about the unlikelihood of these things. So mm -hmm. I don't know, it was sort of maybe uh, cathartic to, to work through these different scenarios for me. I might look like a senior physics professor, but I'm 14 years old inside. <laughs> <laughs> And like any 14-year-old, I like these uh, improbable situations. But, like, but I'm a physics professor. I can actually figure out what actually happens. So it's the perfect combination. <laughs> uh, on that note, please join me in giving a big hand to Paul Doherty and Cody Cassidy. They're here with their new book, And Then You're Dead, What Really Happens If You Get Swallowed by a Whale or Shot from a Cannon, Go Barreling Over Niagara, uh, and a reminder for our audience that their new book is available for sale in the back, and they'll be happy to sign your book in a couple minutes. I'm Kishore Hari, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. No death by gavel, don't worry. No death by gavel, yeah. good.